Monday, August 29th, 2005. The most infamous hurricane in American history makes landfall near the Louisiana-Mississippi border. Hurricane Katrina batters the coastal communities with 125 mile per hour winds and a 30 foot storm surge. In the sub-sea level city of New Orleans, the miles of coastal protection is taking a beating. Levees constructed by the many waterways around the community strain to hold back the extra billions of gallons of water that Katrina has driven in from the Gulf of Mexico. Early that Monday morning, the city's worst fears were realized as one of the levees bordering the 17th Street Canal, the main levee protecting the Lakeview neighborhood of New Orleans, catastrophically failed. One by one in a cruel domino effect, levees protecting the city failed, unleashing a deluge of water into the city and surrounding parishes. What would ensue would become one of the worst natural disasters in United States history. With over 1,800 people dead and $125 billion of damage, uncovering what exactly happened with the flood protection system of New Orleans was a top priority. What was uncovered would shock the nation. Negligence, underestimation, and bureaucracy led to an engineering disaster that would make Hurricane Katrina a storm for the ages. To answer how it all went wrong, we need to understand a couple of things. What levees are, New Orleans' geography, New Orleans' flood control systems, and Hurricane Katrina. First, let's dive into levees. Levees are a pretty simplistic flood control structure. They are large man-made earthen or concrete embankments that separate waterways from settled land. While the structure itself is pretty simple, the hydrology that levees can influence is rather complex. Levees must resist hydrostatic and hydrodynamic forces through the sheer force in the soil they're built upon. Levees are extremely wide at their base for two reasons. Firstly is that hydrostatic pressure increases with depth as water on the top weighs on the water below. If you've ever swam deep into a pool or lake, you felt hydrostatic pressure increase the deeper you went. The second reason is that it increases the area that the shear stress can be dissipated through, increasing the strength of the levee against hydrostatic and hydrodynamic forces. Now that we understand levees, let's dive into New Orleans' geography. New Orleans is in a very precarious location when it comes to the water that surrounds it. When it was first settled by the French in the early 18th century, they built it upon the higher banks of the Mississippi River. Most of the developments utilized these higher banks up until the Flood Act of 1965, which funded flood control projects all along Lake Pontchartrain. This meant that New Orleans could expand beyond the banks that they'd been confined to, as the new flood control infrastructure would allow for developments in what was once wetlands, part of Lake Pontchartrain's floodplain. Fast forward to 2005 where there are now several key waterways that run through New Orleans and the neighboring parishes. There's the 17th Street Canal, London Avenue Canal, Industrial Canal, Intracoastal Waterway, and of course the Mississippi River in Lake Pontchartrain. So with all this water surrounding the city, what measures were put in place to prevent coastal flooding events? New Orleans' flood control system in 2005 was primarily consisting of levees that were designed by the Army Corps of Engineers. As new levees were constructed, there were just as many old levees that were being modified. Many needed to have supplemental walls built into them, as the higher you go with a traditional levee, the wider the base needs to be. With urban developments built right next to the levee, the bases could not be widened, so flood walls were integrated into many of the pre-existing levees with an eye wall configuration. In addition to these levees, there are almost 100 pumping stations positioned strategically throughout the city. Even with all of these measures in place, the right storm at the right time could bring the city to its knees. Tropical Depression 12 formed over the Bahamas on the late afternoon of Tuesday, August 23, 2005. In 24 hours, the National Hurricane Center upgraded the Tropical Depression, making it the 11th named storm of the season, Tropical Storm Katrina. Upon reaching the southeastern Florida coast on Thursday, August 25th, Katrina became a Category 1 hurricane. This first landfall was largely uneventful, slightly weakening the storm. However, Katrina was about to enter the Gulf of Mexico. The unseasonably warm currents in the Gulf turbocharged the storm over the coming days. From Saturday night and into Sunday morning, 
Katrina underwent a rapid intensification, going from a Category 3 to Category 5 storm in only 9 hours. The National Hurricane Center forecasted the second landfall to most likely be southeastern Louisiana. Preparations were already underway in the Bayou State as a federal emergency was declared and residents boarded up and evacuated. For the many that couldn't evacuate, the Superdome in downtown New Orleans was converted into a shelter and even then, many didn't leave their homes. The city held its breath on the evening of Sunday, August 28th. Katrina was on New Orleans' doorstep. Even before the hurricane would make landfall, things started to unfold drastically in the city of New Orleans. Storm surge had already began to overwhelm the areas of the Mississippi River Delta, many of which did not have any flood protection. In the city, many of the levees began to bear the loads of extreme amounts of water being bottlenecked into the waterways surrounding the city. At 5 a.m. on the 29th, the cracks in the flood protection system were beginning to show. The eastern levee of the Industrial Canal suffered its first breach, allowing water to start flowing into the Lower Ninth Ward. At 6 a.m. on the morning of August 29th, Katrina made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane with winds of 125 miles per hour. As the eyewall traversed the communities in the Mississippi River Delta, it brought a 30-foot storm surge to the Mississippi coast. In Louisiana, the storm surge was not as high, at worst around 16 feet. Even with the lower storm surge near New Orleans, a critical flaw was about to be exposed in the design of the levees. Around 6.30 a.m., the city's worst fears were coming to fruition. The eastern levee of the 17th Street Canal was the first to catastrophically fail. Water rushed into the below sea level Lakeview neighborhood of the city. 30 minutes later, the eastern levee of the London Avenue Canal was breached, followed shortly thereafter by the western levee. Up throughout the city on Monday morning, water was rising at least a foot every 10 minutes if you were lucky. The unlucky ones closest to the levee failures didn't stand a chance as the flood water came into the neighborhoods like a wall, overshooting the thousands of single-story homes. The pump stations around the city weren't capable of handling an event of this magnitude, many of which flooded instantly upon levee failures, rendering them useless. Even once Katrina had passed, the gaping holes left in the levees allowed water to continue to pour in for days on end. How could an entire city's flood protection system fail so catastrophically? There are three parts to this answer, so let's dive into the engineering behind New Orleans' levees. The levees in New Orleans were built from earthen material on top of marsh, followed by clay underneath. Levees on soft materials like these can slide under intense hydrostatic and hydrodynamic forces. This is a common issue in levee design. So to make sure that the levees don't slide, the force opposing the hydro forces must be greater. The critical detail to achieve this is to measure the soil strength in the area. Before building the levees, soil samples were taken from where the levees were to be constructed. After testing all of the samples in a lab, sear strength from the samples was plotted onto a graph comparing the strength to the depth of the sample. The engineers would use this plot to influence their design decisions. A shocking discovery found that engineers designing the levees completely misinterpreted the graph, using the near opposite shear profile needed for the levees to hold back the water. To compound this already fatal error, the engineers used a rather low factor of safety. A factor of safety is a measure of how much stronger a design is than what it's rated for. For example, if an elevator is rated for 1,000 pounds and has a factor of safety of two, then the elevator can actually hold 2,000 pounds before failing. The engineers that designed the New Orleans levee system used a factor of safety of 1.3, which is on the very low end of acceptable engineering practices for a structure this vital for people's safety. Finally, there were other missed considerations with levee design. At the 17th Street Canal, erosion on the waterway side of the levee led to a water-filled gap which reduced the effective area of sheer strength of the soil, compromising the levee even further. At the London Avenue Canal Levee, the material beneath the marsh was sand rather than clay. As the water level rose in the canal, the extreme hydrostatic pressure forced enough water into the permeable sand. A well-constructed levee should have had enough weight to overcome the uplift from water pressure. Unfortunately, the design relied too much on the marsh layer of the levee it was built upon, causing water to seep into the other side of the levee. 
Once this became the path of least resistance, erosion whittled away the levee from underneath, reducing it to nothing. At the industrial canal levee, as water began overtopping the levee, water crashed down the eye wall, causing erosion on the dry side of the levee. The material resisting the hydro forces were whittled away, leading to another complete levee failure. Looking beyond the flood protection measures, most of the residential areas in New Orleans hold an inherent risk for flooding. The American Society of Civil Engineers report on the infrastructure failures in Katrina called for the evaluation of even letting people live in the extremely flood-prone areas of the city. Katrina was the worst case scenario for the city, but yet, today in 2022, the neighborhoods of the city that saw the worst flooding have been inhabited once again. Many what-ifs exist in the wake of Katrina. What if the levees were built correctly? What if the pumping stations didn't fail? What if more was done to evacuate residents of the city? What Katrina did do, however, was expose the extreme flaws in the engineering oversight of flood control infrastructure, not only in New Orleans, but in America as a whole. What is certain is that Hurricane Katrina wasn't only just one of the worst natural disasters in American history, but also one of the worst engineering disasters in the nation's history.